faith. Faith is believing that God is, that he exists. There is a God, he is invisible, he created everything out of nothing. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. And faith is believing that whatever God has said in his word, he will do. Even if I don't get the promises during this lifetime, he will give everything he has promised. And I see the future as if it is present. I see the invisible as if it was visible. And, and then I order my life, my decisions. I plan my day. I plan my day for the future invisible realm because I can see it presently in my vision. Because God is, he is faithful. He cannot lie. And if he asks us impossible things, he will give us the power and the strength to do such things. The problem in the book of Hebrews that, that the writer is writing to, they have, they have begun to drift. They have lifted their anchor from the word of God and, and they want to go back to religion, to Judaism, to animal sacrifices, not realizing that Jesus, or forgetting maybe, forgetting that Jesus is greater than all. He's greater than the Old Testament prophets who revealed in part and spoke in part at various times and in various ways. He's greater than all the heavenly angels. He's greater than Moses and Joshua and the whole Levitical tribe. He's greater than the high priests that were on earth. There's no one like Jesus. And everything he says, he will do. Do you believe me? Then our lives should be characterized by endurance. In Hebrews 10, after the fourth warning, the warning was, listen, people, listen, believers, you cannot go back and be resaved and start this whole spiritual journey over again. You are going to give one life in account to the Lord at his reward seat. That is it. You only get one opportunity on earth to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to him. What will you do with it? Will you imitate those who through faith and and patience inherit the promises. And so in Hebrews 11, you have this, this list of men and women who ran a race and they lived well, not all of the time, but at times, by faith. And we are to imitate these in Hebrews 11. Now in Hebrews 12, it continues this theme of running a race with endurance. Since we can't be born again again, and erase the bad record we've established before the Lord as, as believers, as children, then we need endurance. We need to pick up right now, as I mentioned last week. Can you imagine if, uh, if we were running a race here at the Hermantown track and field, and as I'm running, I'm supposed to go around the track four times. That's going to be quite a feat for me. No pun intended. it will be a lot of feat. But, but as I'm running, the first lap is no problem. I just got, I'm fresh. But, but, but after the first lap, I've begun to get weary. I, I've been doing the same thing, running one foot after another around the track. And, and it, I've been going to church, and I, I go to Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then it's the next week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible studies, and, and I do it the next week. And now 30 years have passed, and, and I'm weary. It's, it's so easy to throw in the towel, isn't it? And, and, and then there's obstacles in the track. Now I have to go over some hurdles. And then there's things the Lord allows in my life that, that seem to discourage and defeat and distress me. And I think I just want out of the Christian life. Far easier just to make a lot of money and have a lemonade and sit on a beach. That's the easy way to go. What a way to end have some money, have a lemonade and a lawn chair looking at the ocean waves. But that's not what we've been called to. We have a race that has been set before us. Remember, you're on track three, running around the track. You've, you've stuck with it for, for three laps. And, and all of a sudden, out of the corner of your eye, the sun is reflecting on the golden arches there in, in Hermantown. And you see the McDonald's sign and you're thinking, oh, I would just love some fries and a burger instead of the sweat 
and toil of the track. And so you veer off and, and literally you go and, and now you don't finish your race. But you do. You have to get back on eventually. And wow, what kind of time record will you have there? Some people start their race for Christ and they're eager and fresh and then they burn out. And they get tired of the conflict and the issues and the problems and, and, and they will be in heaven. They will be gloriously saved through the blood of Jesus Christ by their faith. But they will not have run their race well. And the, the key to Hebrews 11 is run your race well. Now, I, I don't want to mislead you. And so I, I don't, in Hebrews 12, I don't believe Abel, Enoch, and Noah, and Abraham and Sarah, and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and Jochebed and Amran, his parents, I, I don't believe they can see us on earth. They're not cheering us on, looking at us run our race in 2024. But metaphorically, they have run their race in their own time period with their own issues of the day. They've got to get up in the morning. They've got to have breakfast. They have to go to work. They put their clothes on like you and I. They had diseases and problems and snakes and famine and hurricane. They had it all as well. But they ran by faith. Will you? This is the question set before us. So I'm going to pick up the text where we left off after Moses. We talked about how Moses, he, he gave up honor he, gave, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the greatest man in the world at the time. He, it was the world empire. It was Pharaoh and then his, his daughter and that generation. And then Moses, he's the grandson of Pharaoh. And he said, I refuse to be called the grandson of Pharaoh. I'm going to give up the title of honor where everybody would bow down to me in the streets and they want my autograph and all the paparazzi are there to take my my ancient pictures of me by the pyramids. Moses is like, I'm giving it all up for the Lord. I'm going to follow the Lord. He gave up the passing pleasures of sin. Moses, being the third in Egypt, he could have had every physical delight, whatever food he wanted. He could have had the entertainment, snap his finger. I want a banjo band. No, I want a harp band. I want, he could have snapped his finger, whatever. He could have gotten whatever he wanted. The, all the passing pleasures of sin. I want a different woman every night of the week. I want all the money and the houses and the fun and the entertainment that go with it. And Moses could have had it all. He could have had it all. The limousine chariots, the white horses with plumes of feathers on their head, prancing around and everybody's saying, there goes great Moses. And he, he gave up all the temporary passing pleasures of sin. Why? Because he valued the shame that comes with the Jewish Messiah as more valuable than anything else. He made the right choices. Will you? He gave up all the treasures of Egypt. Now it says we have four mountain peaks. You know, we don't get all the details of the Old Testament. I'm just telling you what the Hebrew writer is giving us. So I'm going to give you four short historical scenes. And we don't have time to go into everything that happened between. But, but we're going to hit these, these points that the writer, that God wants us to know that will encourage us along the way. Because some of you might feel doubtful, discouraged, distressed, dismayed, overwhelmed, overcome with the burdens and the issues of life. There could be great fears, great obstacles that seem insurmountable. And God says, but if you trust me, I always have the way always. Father, we bow before you and ask for wisdom and insight into the text, the sacred text of your word. These men and women of faith didn't always have great victory. Some were tortured, not accepting deliverance. For whatever reason, you didn't allow them to avoid torture. Others avoided it. And, and part of their race, they didn't have that or they escaped it. Many believers were in chains and imprisonments, beaten, killed, sawn in half. We don't understand your ways. Your ways are mysterious. You move in mysterious ways, your wonders to perform. 
Why some had great acts of victory in their life, others were victorious in their suffering and their death, even wandering about in dens and caves of whom the world was not worthy. O oh, Father, may we be men and women of faith, trusting that whatever your word says for the New Testament believer, you will do. We in the church can learn from the old. We must learn from the old. And we must live out all of the principles for the local church. Only then will you be pleased. So guide and direct our path. Teach us from these Old Testament historical truth scenes. And may we learn and grow in our faith for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, the first mountain peak that we come to is found in verse 28, Hebrews 11, 28. You read it, but let's think about it. I love the Bible because the Bible makes us think deeply. It makes us, it makes us think, what is going on here? Hebrews eleven twenty eight. by faith, he, Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Passover is Tuesday for the Jewish nation. This Tuesday is Passover. April 23rd. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Keep your place in Hebrews 11. We'll go back there, but we'll, we'll look at these just briefly. The nation Israel has been captive to Egypt as slaves for 430 years, a long time, and it seems like there's no getting out. Yet Abraham... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Amran and Jochebed, Moses' parents, see that their child is beautiful, that he will be the one to re release and redeem Israel from slavery. So they protect the boy. And then Moses comes on the scene at 80 years old. He's been 40 years in the, the Pharaoh's house, and then he's 40 years on the backside of the Mount Sinai in the, in the desert. And now at 80 years old, he comes back into Egypt to, to demand, let my people go. And God uses Moses, God empowers, he does all the work, and Moses is simply the tool, and there's nine plagues. You can read all about the plagues in the previous chapters. You've got the Nile turning to blood, you've got the frogs, you've got the lice, you've got the flies, you've got all of the nine plagues, and Pharaoh's heart is still hard. And so the Lord says there's going to be a tenth plague, and the angel of death that I send, God says, will kill and strike the firstborn of every house, firstborn of man or beast. So the firstborn son and the firstborn of the beasts of the animals even will die on a certain night when the angel of death comes upon all of Egypt, even in the Jewish homes. No one can escape this judgment of death. Jewish, Egyptian, it doesn't matter. The angel of death is coming. And the Lord says in chapter 12, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months, shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Verse 5, Your lamb shall be, a, shall be without blemish, a male, just like Jesus is without blemish, the lamb of God, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Verse 6, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. That's the, now the day of Passover, we call it. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Everybody's going to kill their own lamb. Every house, their own lamb at the same time. Three in the afternoon. Everybody's killing their lamb. The bones cannot be broken. The, it has to be roasted over fire like Jesus bore the penalty of our sin on the cross. The lamb, no bones broken, roasted over fire with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. But then the Lord said, verse 7, They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And they have to stay inside the house. If you leave the house, the firstborn will die. You stay in the house with blood on your lintel and on the two doorposts. This sounds weird and strange to us. And it must have to the congregation of Israel. Moses tells the nation, there's going to be a tenth plague, the death of your firstborn son. If you want protection, 
take a lamb, kill it. Don't break any of his bones. Roast it over fire. Take the blood and paint the doorpost of your, blood, of, your, of your house with blood, animal blood. And stay inside and be, have your sandals on and be ready to leave in a hurry. It says in Hebrews 11, verse 28, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood. Moses believed that what God said would happen. If the angel of death sees the blood on the doorpost and the lamb that has been slain as is a firstborn male without blemish and is roasting on a pit on a spit the angel of death will come over your house and no one will die and moses believed god's word and he acted on it and the nation did as well and all of their firstborn were saved but the egyptian firstborn of man or beast they all died do you see how important faith is Faith is acting on, first of all, faith is trusting that the Lord is who he says he is and will do what he says he has done. He died on the cross for our sins, and we need faith in Jesus to be born into his family. But we also need to live by faith, and whatever he says, he will do. Can you imagine? People might have been saying this, but wait a minute, Moses, I want a side of macaroni and cheese, and I don't, I've only got a few lambs, I don't want to give my firstborn. I'd rather give the runt. I'd rather give the lame and the the weak and the one that's deaf and the one that's going to die anyways. Why should we give God the first and the best, like he asks? Nobody is saying that. Because for nine plagues, they have seen the hand of God work. No, the finger of God work. The Pharaoh's magicians, they said these plagues are of the finger of God. The hand of God, which brings salvation, is even greater than that. Right? Right? Nobody is arguing with God's word because they want their firstborn alive. Whatever God says, we will. Do you know trials and obstacles like plagues and death do that to us? They humble us and they break us of our own will. And we say, Lord, I I know now whatever you say I want to do. Let me do it. You tell me to kill a firstborn lamb of mine? It's going to cost me? There's going to be some sacrifice of my own? And then I have to take messy, stinky blood and put the warm blood on the doorpost and then stay inside all night? I guess it means no movies for me. No bowling tonight. No no clubs tonight for me. Everybody is willing to submit to the word of God. I find that when things are going well, we don't necessarily want to follow God. We want him to follow us. We're having a time of our life. Get on the roller coaster, Lord. We're having a joy ride here. And, And right now, the church, I feel like we're on a joy ride. I feel like Boy, things are going well, and God is doing great, great things. Beware. We must follow his word. We must. And they do. The angel of death comes over, and house after house has agonizing screams. Oh, my firstborn! How many deaths and funerals that day? But the Jewish people were saved by trusting the Lord and his word. That whatever God, if God said our, ch- our children will be safe in the house with blood on the doorpost, then we'll do that. If I tell you today, the only way you can get to heaven is by faith in Jesus alone, through his shed blood on the cross and his resurrection for you. It's not by religion, good works, prayers, Bible readings, church attendance. There's nothing you can do to please him. Nothing. Zero. You must come all upon him. Rest your weight fully on him. And many people will say, no, I'd rather have the firstborn die as the angel of death brings his destruction on the land. Will you believe? Will you believe? Let's go back to Hebrews 11. Looking for the next mountain peak. I asked you to stay there and I myself didn't. Hebrews 11, verse 29. By faith... They passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. No, this is our next mountain peak of faith. But but let's go look at it In, in Exodus, please. Chapter 13 is where we want to start. Exodus 13, verse 17. Oh, there's so much to learn here. Exodus 13, 17. 
Keep your place here in, and Hebrews. We're going to be going back and forth. Verse 17, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go. Now 600,000 men came out by foot, figuring most of them had wives, and they had probably more than one child. You're talking uh, one and a half to two million people have now left. Do you, that's a, that's a, a huge group of people. That's a, a huge walk through the desert with two, some two million people. It says, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. The shortest way to the promised land was an 11-day journey. You could do it in 11 days, even with that size group. You leave Egypt, you go along the Mediterranean Sea, it's called the Via Maris, by the way of the sea. It'll take you 11 days and you're at the border. And then all you do is you just cross the border and the promised land is all yours. The problem is there's an enemy and obstacles and God knows the human heart and he knows Israel. If they take the shortcut, they're going to be defeated. They will run and they will fail. They will completely fall and they'll go back to Egypt and they'll be back in slavery. Do you know that's why God puts things in our life? So I, I Really, we want the easy life, don't we? We want the quickest and easiest way to success. And sometimes God says, I'm going to put this in your life. You didn't ask for it and you didn't want it, but I'm going to allow it or I'm going to, I'll, I'll do it. And the purpose is not to defeat or discourage. He knows that if we went the easy route, we would not end up like we need. And so he brings them, verse, 14, verse 18, oh, ver, the end of verse 17, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. If the way is insurmountable, and these people have not learned any lessons, they're going to go back to Egypt. You know, you know why you're here? I'll tell you the reality of it. You're sitting in church here today because God is training you. He is working and training in your life for future things. He is preparing you for something that might happen later this year or next year or the year after, and you are being taught right now how to live that out by faith, trusting the Lord with joy and confidence. Even though it's, not a, it, it's one of these Red Sea experiences, we are being trained for future things. You understand? I'm not just teaching this how we have a cute story and we can go home for some lunch. I'm training you how to handle the things that are coming in your future. The Word of God is training you. Verse 18 so God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Who put Israel in, the, in front of the Red Sea? They have left Egypt. God said, you walk this way. And they did. And they get to the Red Sea, and it's deep. And the sea is there, and they cannot swim across of it. They are, in a, they are in a geographical tight spot. They're between a rock and a hard spot. They cannot go north. It is impossible for them to move north. They cannot go south. They look back. And Pharaoh and his army are coming. But I want you to see this in chapter 14. Here's what God said to Moses. And this is what you and I need to learn. Exodus 14, verse 3. Uh, verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Phi Haharot, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, or Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. God put them in that exact location, knowing, knowing that it would be impossible for them to survive. There is no way out of Israel to survive but by trusting him. And God put them there. Does he do that to us? The times I have grown the most in my faith is not when everything is going well. It's when I have nowhere to turn but to the Lord. I can't go forward, I can't go back, I can't go right, I can't go left. And I'm like, okay, I'm stuck. Now I need your strength and wisdom and power and glory. Verse 3, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them. See, the Lord even knows what Pharaoh's thinking. Pharaoh's back in Egypt and he's like, we lost two million slaves. They were a huge part of our economy. That was our workforce. Now we've got to do manual labor. I don't like that. These Jewish people are wandering about in the wilderness. They have no idea. They've put themselves into a trap. And they have nowhere to go except to me. Can you picture this? See, God knows what Pharaoh's thinking. 
Whatever is going on in your life, God already knows. He knows all about it. He knows the, the outcome. He knows what the enemy would say to us. But look at what God tells Moses in verse 4. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Moses already knows. Nobody else knows. But Moses knows God is leading us to an impossible place. And he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh is coming after us. This magnificent army of Egypt, which is so powerful, and we're just slaves, former slaves, with not even a weapon. We have no trained militia. We have no organization. We just, we're a hodgepodge of people. And, and Moses knows God is going to cause, well, Pharaoh's going to harden his own heart, and God is going to solidify that, and Pharaoh's going to chase after Israel to destroy them. Look at verse 4. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know, here it is, that, the, that I am the Lord. Why is God allowing Pharaoh to close in and tighten the noose around Israel? Because he says, I want my honor and glory to be made known. He's not puffing up Israel. He said, I want all of the Egyptians to know that I am the only Lord and God. Isn't that an interesting perspective on our problems? We got problems. Everybody in this room has problems of some kind. Spiritual, emotional, physical, financial, political. I mean, you name it, we have problems. And God says, it's nothing about you, but God says, I want my name known. I want my glory. I want all the world to bow their knee to me to show that I am a God of justice and mercy. Verse 4, and they did so. They obeyed. So then, of course, verse 7, Pharaoh took 600 choice chariots. Choice chariots. I don't know what makes them choice. Sounds like a groovy word from the 70s, but these were the best chariots, 600 of the best, plus a bunch of others, all the other chariots of Egypt. Anybody that had a chariot, get in the, get in the army. And then verse 8, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. He pursued the children of Israel. Verse 9, the Egyptians pursued them, all, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. His horsemen and his army overtook them camping. You got the Jewish nation at the side of the Red Sea and they've got their tents pitched and their little fires and they're having salmon loaf and, 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 and they, they hear a rumble and they look and they see Pharaoh and the glint of his armor and chariot and they see hundreds. Have you seen 600 chariots in a wilderness? Plus, those are choice chariots, plus all the other chariots. Do you know what kind of noise and dust they, they rally up? And you would be thinking, we're dead. They will be on us in hours, and we will be completely annihilated. Every one of us with a spear thrust through our stomach or, or chest, even the babies, there's, there's no way we're going to survive. Verse 10, and when Pharaoh drew near... The children of Israel lifted their eyes. They've been looking at their tents and their children. Now they're looking at the army. You do that ever? Like we're do, serving the Lord, doing our thing, and then, and then a problem comes, like Pharaoh's army. We lift our eyes and, and we begin to see the problem for what it really is. It's huge. I mean, that's a, that's a big obstacle. This is a, this is a serious deal. We're not talking. I just... You know, my paycheck got delayed by two days by the U.S. Post Office. We're talking, this is death. This is death. This is, this is it. There, there's nothing we can do. So what do they do? They panic. So they were very afraid. And, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. But in the Hebrew, the word cry is to scream. They're screaming at the Lord. And then who do they turn their anger at? The Lord's servant, Moses. Verse 11, they said to Moses, because there are no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? 
Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Well, they don't want to die. They don't want to die. Do you know that panic is a natural reaction? Fear and anxiety, worry is a natural reaction. But we have a supernatural God. You agree? We do. We have a supernatural God. Our, 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 the natural reaction is to be afraid, to panic, to scream, to cry, to do everything we can. To, can you imagine? I can imagine somebody in the Jewish camp saying, okay, everybody, swimming lessons are now $100 an hour. Come here and I'll teach you how to swim across the Red Sea. Somebody else is like, oh, I'm going to teach uh, how to survive bivouac in the wilderness. You come here and I'll teach you how to survive uh, with, with no... No food and no, no clothes, no nothing. And, and they've, they don't have time for this kind of thing. But this is what we do. Something comes in our life and God is, God is wanting us to walk by faith and to believe him and to trust him. And we've got all sorts of plans and manipulations and, I, and I'm going to solve this whole thing and I'm going to get out of this, this, this situation myself. Well, verse 13, Moses said to the people, here's his counsel, do not be afraid. Now they're screaming at God and they're screaming at him and he stands up, he gets, I don't know, where is he standing? It's maybe some big rock. And he gets everybody quiet and he says, first, do not be afraid. Now if you are a mom or a dad or a grandma or grandpa and you, you can hear the roar of the army, you can see their spears and swords, you see the aggression on the soldiers' faces, all you can picture is death and blood and anguish everywhere. And Moses is saying, calm down, don't be afraid. Why? Because God already told Moses what he was going to do. God had already said, I am going to get glory in all of Egypt. I am going to let Pharaoh chasten you and tighten the noose. Will you trust me? So Moses, verse 13, do not be afraid, stand still. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. And that's okay. That's where God wants us. God wants us. You know, it's like me helping Melissa in the kitchen. I, I, I mess up every, well, when I do, I, I mess up everything. She's like, well, just, you're, I know you want to be helpful, but get out. You know, it's, it's easier without you. And the Lord's like to the Jewish people, I don't need your swimming lessons, your wilderness techniques. I want you to trust me. Will you let me work on your behalf? Can you do that? Stand still and see the deliverance, the salvation of the Lord. This is not like, this is a physical deliverance, which he will accomplish for you today. Notice who's going to accomplish it. He God is going to accomplish it. Moses tells the people, do not be afraid. Stand still. No more human manipulation and human wisdom and effort. A and watch the Lord accomplish this on your behalf. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Now Moses, has, I don't see that Moses has been told how it's going to happen. Because that's going to come up in just a minute. Moses has no idea how that army is going to be destroyed. But God said it will be destroyed, and it's going to be destroyed. He doesn't know. Moses doesn't have that insight yet. And then God says to Moses, hold your rod over the sea. And the sea parted. And you know how when uh, like a bog or a swamp dries up, even after it's been dried up for a long time, if you step in it, how deep do you go? You go up to your waist or ankles or knees in mud. It's, it's not dry ground. That takes a long, long time. But here, God simply parts the Red Sea. And he, he, I'm going to show you a text in Isaiah 63. I, got, I guess we're getting two mountain peaks today, not four. Tonight, we'll get the other two. We'll get the Jericho and Rahab. But, but um, I, we'll go to Isaiah 63 in a minute. But it's um, completely smooth. Like no rocks, no obstacles, completely smooth. And, and now it's opened up and there's dry land. And Moses says, we're going by faith through the water. And they do. 
And they get on the other side, and Pharaoh's army, like Hebrews 11 says, attempting to do so also. But they, they, they lack one thing. They lack faith in the, in the God of Israel. And so as they're partway through, Moses has, tells God, and, or God uses Moses, and the waters overtake the Pharaoh's army, and they all perish in the water. Look at verse 18 what, real quick for the same theme here. Exodus 14, 18. God is tr- definitely trying to teach us something. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's the issue. The issue with everything you go through is will everyone around you know that Jesus Christ is the only Lord and God? That is what counts. That is the, Now go to Isaiah 63 and we'll end here. Isaiah 63. I'm looking forward to Jericho and Rahab tonight. Isaiah 63, speaking about the second coming of Jesus and about God's mercy. We're going to remember God's mercy to Old Testament Israel. Look at verse 11. Isaiah 63, 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he, where is Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord God, who put his Holy Spirit within them? Interesting. Verse 12. Who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm. This word, there's two words in the Hebrew for glorious. Can, do you mind if I share this with you? In, in the end of Isaiah, there's, there, the word glory and glorious is used over and over and over. There's, there's two Hebrew words. One is kavod. Kavod is, is weight, heaviness. Like if I, like if I have a, a calm pond and I throw a, a light pebble in the pond, it makes light ripples. Small ripples, but it, it has little influence. Like, if your rowboat is in the small pond and I throw a little, a little rock, it's not going to affect the rowboat. But if I throw a heavy cavode, a heavy weight, a heavy mountain rock into the little pond, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change and impact everything. So there's a glory that just shatters and shouts with power. And then there's a second word, that's kavod. The second Hebrew word is pa'ar. Pa'ar means it's a glory that attracts. Like, that's a glorious painting. I'm very attracted to the painting. It's a glorious garden. I'm attracted to the garden. It's a, it's a, so this is um, a glory that attracts. God saved Israel out of the Red Sea, out of the destruction of Pharaoh's army, with a, with, a, with a beauty that is attractive. After that scene, every Jewish person, everyone should have said, okay, I don't, I don't care what, what else happens in this whole universe. Every day I'm living for the God who parted the Red Sea. It's going radically, to radically change my life. It's going to reorient all of my passions and my priorities. Because that's the beauty of God that attracts me. That's the beauty. And how many days was it after the Red Sea before they complained and murmured? Three. Three days after this event, they're complaining and murmuring, God, can't stand that God. Oh, I wish we had a different God. Oh, we're thirsty and we're hungry. Oh, we've got lots of provisions from the Egyptians, but I want something different. I want a Big Mac meal. I don't want these cucumbers and leeks. I, I want water. You know, I, I want, I, and they're complaining. Well, he goes on, verse 12, dividing the water before them, hear it again, to make for himself in everlasting name. It is all about the glory and the exaltation of Christ, of God. The reason you're going through whatever you're going through is that God might be exalted and glorified and that all the world will know that the God you follow is the only Savior, the only one. And maybe there's no other way that God's name is going to be made known but, then, but through the obstacle that you're facing, that you're going through. And then he ends with this, verse 13, who led them through the deep. 
This Red Sea was not shallow. Oh, I've heard liberal scholars say the Red Sea, it was like two inches deep. And they just scattered across it and kicked the water up and it looked like dry ground. It wasn't two inches deep. The Bible says the Red Sea was deep at that spot. So they, it was deep. And he led them through the deep. And, and these are our obstacles. They're deep. As a horse in the wilderness. You ever see a horse in the wilderness? This word wilderness, it's a, a smooth, open plain. Like not a rock to stumble with. They just go and it's just, it's easy. You ever take a horse? I haven't. But if you ever take a horse through like a bunch of rocky areas, boy, the horse has to, you know, it's, it's, then they stumble and they, they, uh, their hoof slips on big rocks here and there. No, there's not a rock to be seen and the horse does not stumble. So then God says this, I led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they might not stumble. See, that's the way God works. That's, we, we have to trust this God. We have to. We have to put our trust in him. He is the only one who can save us. The only one. We cannot go anywhere else for this kind of deliverance. Nowhere. This is everlasting, eternal deliverance. Even if I die in the process. Even if I'm tortured, imprisoned, chained, beaten. And some today, for the cause of Christ, are being beaten. And scourged. And killed and imprisoned for their faith. Well, you know what I'm asking you to do? I love what Dr. McLaughlin has said um, numerous times when I've talked with him or when he was here preaching. He said this, you want long obedience in the same direction. You just want to follow the Lord and obey the Lord. It's long obedience in the same direction. You just never quit. You're like, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to read his word. I'm going to know his word. I'm going to trust his word. There is no better life. Again, it doesn't always end up pleasant. Sometimes there's torture and imprisonment involved. Sometimes there's living in a cave or a den and wearing goat skin and camel skin for clothes instead of um, express suits. You know, we don't know what... See, you're going to hear this next Sunday. Well, probably not. Maybe two Sundays from now. You're going to hear this, um, or three Sundays from now. In Hebrews 12, run the, run the race, the specific race that is set before you. God has already set our course. We just need to follow him. I'm not designing my own course. He has set the course for the race that I run. He knows the duration of the race. He knows the, the obstacles of the race. And he says, Brian, you trust me. And if you do, he is a rewarder of those who, who do so. Praise God. Now, if you're not a believer, this is where you start. You put your faith in Jesus Christ or you will perish. You will perish. Tonight, if you come back, you can hear about Rahab. Rahab, out of all of Jericho, she believes in the God of Israel and she is saved and she's a descendant. Uh, Jesus is a descendant of her. It's marvelous, but we'll talk Jericho and Rahab. And then we've got a list of other names that are only mentioned. And I might just draw one or two quick things out of those individuals as well. Um, I'm trying not to, to bog down too much, of the, but I think this is such great application for us. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for our time together. Oh, these are, are weighty things that we are, we are asked to think about them. The Holy Spirit has given us these things to think about, to meditate on, to chew on. Oh, I pray everyone here would go back to Exodus 12 and Exodus 14 and, and revisit these scenes and look at the faith of Israel and the faith of Moses. Even when most didn't believe and they cried out and screamed against you, they, they, they didn't like you and they didn't like Moses, and yet they walked by faith through the Red Sea. And so you can even take us and grow our faith today. But thank you for the study in Hebrews, and I pray this is profitable to these, these sheep in the fold as it has been to me. And I pray that you will bless and guard and keep each one for your glory and honor. Save those who are lost and build up the believer. Amen. All right, God bless, faith family. See you tonight. <laughs>